this is a topic uh, talking about relationship of Mesoamerica and the Southwest, which is an enormous topic. It's one that I first started on when I took uh, Emil Howery's last uh, graduate seminar on Southwest archaeology. Uh, and I remember, uh, you know, at that time I, I did a term paper uh, critiquing Charles de Peso's ideas of post tech in the Southwest. Uh, and that then started me on this, uh, this being a, a part of my career. And I've talked about this topic many, many times. Uh, and uh, so each time it changes a little, although uh, tonight I'm only going to give you the bare bones and just try to say a few provocative things that might make some of the people in this room angry. I won't point them out, but uh, uh, there are several people I might be able to make angry, or at least uh, in inspire them to say something. Um, I mean, I, I do have fond memories of Doc. Uh, one memory I have of Doc was, uh, and my position very much develops from his, but one memory I have of Doc was that uh, one time this, I was called down to the Arizona State Museum, uh, off, uh, down to the desk there in the Arizona State Museum because somebody had brought something in to be identified, which was something happened to us quite often. I looked at what the object and I said, well, I have no idea what this is, but I can tell you it's not, it's not from Arizona or Sonora or northern Mexico. It's not from the Southwest. And the person got very upset. Uh, and then they looked at me and said, well, you know, you're really young. Uh, at the time I was, uh, of course not now, at the time I was, she said, I want to talk to somebody older. And I said, OK. And so I sent her to Doc. And about uh, a week later, I saw Doc in the halls there in the, in the, in the museum. And he came up and he said, Randy, did you send that lady to me? And I said, well, yes, Doc, I did. And he said, uh, do you, did, have you ever seen anything like that figurine she had? And I said, no, I hadn't. He said, I hadn't either. I told her I, I didn't know what it was, but it wasn't from the Southwest. She got very angry. <laughs> so I presume somebody had been sold a bill of goods. Uh, the, basic the basic position that I want to uh, start with here in terms of talking about Southwest Mesoamerican relationships is that, of course, everybody that's talked about it before me is wrong. <laughs> this is, of course, the academic position we always start from. Uh, but seriously, what I want to argue is that the interpretations that have been made have been either too specific or too general. That, in fact, the relationships between uh, Southwest, I, I prefer Southwest Northwest because it includes Northwest Mexico, not just the Southwest United States, but that the relations between the Southwest Northwest and Mesoamerica uh, are both more complicated and more simple than most people have advocated. There's been kind of two schools of thought on this. There has been a school of thought that sees the two regions very connected, uh, Charles de Peso being one of the, the, the figureheads, honored figureheads of, uh, of this. Uh, and the, in this school, uh, the, all of this comes down to events, and it comes down to direct connections, uh, postecas, uh, Mesoamerican elites, uh, people coming up from Mesoamerica and bringing with them all the glorious stuff from Mesoamerica that Southwestern peoples had to just, you know, hey, this is great, we got to take this, or, or conquests, or Toltec thugs is one of my favorites. Uh, but they were supposedly cannibals, but that's another paper. Uh, so, yeah, oh yeah, in two months, you may, Ruth may speak to that one. Anyway, uh, uh, or the other side of this has been, and, I, and I'm afraid some of the, uh, the people guilty of this are in the room, so I won't point them out, but anyway, uh, uh, has been to basically kind of say, okay, there, that the Southwest has origins in Mesoamerica. We know maize came from Mesoamerica. We know that things like that came from Mesoamerica. Uh, and that then there's been influences, and then after you've said that, you just ignore it. In other words, you've said it, now you can talk about the interesting stuff, which is the pile of pot shirts on the table in front of you. All right, and you can move on. And I want to argue that the Southwest, the Southwest Northwest, and Mesoamerica were both uh, more connected and less connected than much of the debate uh, that has gone on uh, before now. Um, now, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about what makes the Southwest look like Mesoamerica. I think the easiest way to do that, I mean, my title you know, talked about pole climbing clowns and uh, uh, feathered serpents, and, and these are things that, uh, rituals that originate in Mesoamerica, rituals, beliefs, uh, icons that originate uh, to the South and, and come here from the South. But I think one of the best ways to do this is that uh, in, the, in the 1590s, uh, of course, Coronado came up in the 1540s and came back all disappointed having failed to find what he was looking for. Uh, in the, the 1590s, a group of Spanish uh, 
uh, friars uh, came up north and they came back reporting they'd found a Nueva Mexico, a New Mexico. Uh, the term for the state of New Mexico, New Mexico, actually goes back to the 1590s. And what they were trying to say is they'd found yet another, they, they found another Aztec. They'd found another Mexica uh, in the north. And there are lots and lots of parallels we can see in beliefs, in things like feathered serpents, in rituals, uh, things like pole climbing, although I'll tell you right now, the pole climbing probably comes up with uh, uh, native uh, indigenous mercenaries that came up with the Spanish uh, Oñate conquest. It does not probably predate that. Uh, but anyway, and so we see a whole variety of things that are that, that in the primarily Pueblo religion, but also in belief systems of other groups that clearly link or have some kind of relationship to uh, Mesoamerica. And this leads us to a paradox. This, this linkage clearly exists. And, you know, so there's a profound degree of shared cosmology, iconography, metaphor, and ritual between the two regions. Some people, like Shasma, would say the Southwest and Mesoamerica were undeniably and extrably linked. Uh, ben Nelson once talked about this yet in terms of the two regions being like two languages that have many cognates, many cognate words, but yet have fundamentally different syntaxes and grammars. And uh, I would kind of uh, agree with, with Ben. So we're looking with somewhat of a paradox here. So how did this happen? How did it come about? And more importantly, how are we going to understand it? How should we put it together? I think that one of the first things we have to realize is that the thinking of this in terms of the Southwest, Northwest versus Mesoamerica is a fundamentally flawed place to start. Uh, that we work with these categories. Uh, you know, everybody's seen you know, books on Southwest archaeology. I'm sure many of you have read them. I'm looking, I don't see anyone who's written a book on the whole of Southwest archaeology, but uh, many of you have read them. And, uh, you know, they treat the Southwest as if it's something that existed from the Clovis all the way to the present. Well, that's, that's bullshit. I mean, uh, it didn't. It, it, we, we need to look at uh, these regions in terms of a more dynamic point of view. We need to look at them as being uh, more sloppy and their boundaries as being fuzzy, and most of all, we need to look at them as being more dynamic. And one of the fundamental problems in talking about southwestern Mesoamerican relations has been an approach that sees Mesoamerica as somehow some uniform thing uh, through time and space that the southwest can somehow reach down into and extract, if you're in the influence school, and extract uh, things from or if you're in the kind of event school, you know, uh, people can come rumming up uh, and, you know, conquer Chaco and, and, and eat people's children and stuff like that. Or uh, Postecas can come up and build Casas Grandes or whatever. Uh, and it's really, we, we need a much more complicated uh, view of this and what's going on. Now, and we also need to realize that, that in terms of these kinds of relations, that, uh, that there are things going on uh, over time, that we're not talking about uh, just a series of events, that we're talking about changes over time. So a lot of people have suggested, including I think some people in this room, uh, that uh, some, of the, some of these ideas and all that we see uh, from Mesoamerica actually come up with agriculture, and they come up with uto aztecan language, that there's an expansion of uto aztecan speakers into the Southwest, uh, that brings with us agriculture and presumably many other things. Uh, flower, uh, the idea of the flower world, which is a, a common Mex uh, Mesoamerican ideology, uh, come with that. Also, if we, but if we begin to start looking, though, uh, at the formative, and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to use the Mesoamerican phase sequence, period sequence in, in, in laying this stuff out. If we start looking at the for formative, this begins, and of course the formative is the combination of uh, ceramics, houses, and agriculture, maize agriculture. Now we know now that, you know, the old idea is this all came as a package, but we know now that's clearly not true. We know now that maize agriculture precedes these other things by maybe as much as 2,000 years, uh, by quite a, quite a bit of time. Uh, but in uh, Mesoamerica, in the, or in northern uh, Mesoamerica, we see the earliest uh, formative stuff at about AD 200, or I mean 200 BC, about 200, 250 BC. And in West Mexico, what we see in this time period is, are things that, you know, in terms of you know, archaeologists' favorite stuff, you know, pottery. You know, uh, archaeologists love pottery. 
we see uh, many parallels with what we see in the Southwest. It's red on brown, it's quarter designs, the vessel forms look very much like things we see further, further north. Uh, I would argue that if we're talking about the time period uh, of the uh, early epochs BC or the, the ending epochs uh, before the Common Era and the early epochs uh, of the Common Era, that we're going to see not a lot of difference between uh, ceramics and other things that are going on in western Mexico and down in uh, the Chalchuichis area, which is uh, kind of Durango, Zacatecas, kind of that area. That, that, that these things are going to look really familiar to us and very much the same. And, and in this time period, I have trouble drawing a line and saying, this is, uh, this is northern Mesoamerica and this is southwest northwest. I, I, I think that's a very difficult thing to do. Now, what we then see, though, however, is a development in northern Mexico of uh, a consistent set of or developments along the west coast of Mexico. This is commonly referred to as West Mexico. That's not too hard. Uh, and we're talking about basically an area from Michoacan uh, up to uh, all the way up into, I would argue, the United States. And West Mexico in this period develops in a way that is very, very different than what we're seeing in Mesoamerica. And there are Mesoamericanists and people who work in Mex West Mexico debate whether or not West Mexico in these time periods should be considered part of Mesoamerica or not. If, you, if we had a bunch of Mesoamerican archaeologists here, we could get a pretty good debate going. Uh, on that issue, whether in this time period uh, it should be considered part of it or not. We also have the Chalchuichis region, which is again up around uh, Durango, Zacatecas, northern Mexico. We're talking about regions very northern Mexico here, which is very, very different than what's going on in what's referred to as core Mesoamerica, which is that uh, part of Mexico south of the Rio Lerma. And if anybody could do that geography in their heads, I'm really impressed. Uh, but anyway, uh, the real Laramie is quite a bit south of the border. It's almost 900 kilometers south of the border. So uh, it's quite a ways south of, of, of here. Uh, and we see in West Mexico uh, development of a whole set of things. Uh, red on buff pottery, uh, zoomorphic kind of cartoonish looking designs, uh, shell bracelets, shell. Uh, you get the shell bracelet technology uh, that we see in the Hohokam. It goes all the way down to Nayarit, and if all you're looking at is the bracelets, you cannot tell them apart from Hohokam bracelets. Now, there is engraved shell, which varies along that coast, along that route. But if you look at the bracelets, all the way down to Nayarit, we're talking about south of Acapulco here, uh, this stuff looks uh, the same. And so what I and Elisa Villapando, uh, who I work with in uh, Sonora, have argued is that in this time period, we're seeing a separate set of developments that are not really horribly Mesoamerican looking, but are very much linked to what's going on in the, the Southwest Northwest. And one of the problems in the Southwest Northwest has always been the whole calm don't look right. And in fact, as uh, an archaeologist, Reed, and I can't think of his first name, uh, I'm looking for help. Uh, uh, Jeffrey. No, not Jeffrey. No, no, no. R E E D. Paul Reed. Paul Reed. As Paul Reed once said, he wished that the gas and purchase had never occurred so the whole economy would have stayed in Mexico where they belong. <laughs> and this is in print. He said this in print. I can get, you know, if, if, if I wasn't thinking on my feet here, I could give you a citation. Uh, and uh, basically, Elise and I agree with him. Uh, because the whole com, you know, if you're thinking about what I just described for being what's going on in West Mexico, if you know a lot about whole com, you realize I've just described what's going on in whole com. And indeed, up and through the, about the AD 800s, this is what's going, you know, Hohokam looks a lot like what's happening in West Mexico, uh, very much. And there's a continuum, uh, Trincheras, where I work, Guadabampo, uh, further south into Sinaloa, where this stuff looks very much the same. And again, the, the, the shell jewelry is just striking uh, how similar uh, it looks. Uh, the ceramic design, also Chalchuichis. There's been, you know, lots of talk. You look at Howery's stuff in, the, in his, his, his report on Snake Town. He talks about the parallels to Chalchuichis. The only thing that really, if you look at Chalchuichis' designs in this period, they're very cartoonish looking, zoomorphic, anthropomorphic, like the Ocom stuff, but with lots of little dots. And dots, I don't know what the dots are doing there. But if you take them out, these look like Ocom designs. Uh, some Mexican archaeologists that I've, uh, I'm familiar with, I've worked with, have found red on buff pottery in Michoacan, which they claim to be identical to Hohokam. 
They're overstating their, perp they're overstating their uh, you know, that's a bit of an overstatement. I've told them, well, you know, I've seen a lot of whole compottery and I wouldn't say it's identical, but it's really close. It is really strikingly close. And we're talking about Michoacan, which is a, a long way south of here. Very, hmm? How far? How far? Uh, probably about 600 kilometers might not help. Uh, <laughs> six or 700 kilometers. Anybody do a quick translation of that into miles? Three or 400 miles, yeah, south of, of here. And uh, these Mexican archaeologists have gone so far as to propose that the Hoacom originated Michoacan, migrated to the southwest, and then migrated back to become the Tarascans. Now, I don't buy that. Uh, but uh, there's clearly uh, these parallels that I would so that uh, Lisa Viapano and I have suggested that in this time period before AD 900, uh, that the Hoacom uh, really are not, are, rather than being an island of Mesoamerican. Uh, influence, which is an old interpretation that Howry and others made, that they're really the northern tip of a peninsula that reaches all the way down into uh, West Mexico. And we would argue this, uh, you know, why, why did it look like an island before and it looks like a peninsula now has to do with research and work. West Mexico has not been uh, heavily uh, researched, but as we research it more, I think this looks more and more the same. Now, as we move into, so in the, in, the, in the classic period in Mesoamerica, and that's what we're talking about now, we're talking about AD 200 to 600, roughly. Uh, in those time periods, you have great centers. Teotihuacan, you know, the big show with all the pyramids and all. Those of you who've been to Mexico City, if you've been to Las Piramides, that's Teotihuacan. It is really impressive. It is one of the largest city. It is probably the largest city in the Americas, although Chan Chan might beat it out, I'm not sure. No, it beats the hell out of Cahokia. It doesn't even compare. <laughs> no, no. All, all, the one, one pyramid at Teotihuacan has more volume than all of the, the constructions at, Teo, at Cahokia. And um, so you have these kind of, of big centers, Monte Alban, Teotihuacan. And as we move towards the end of the classic period, these things collapse. They, they disappear. And you get a, a reorganization in Mesoamerica that's called the Epiclassic. And this period, I think, is very important to understanding what's going on up here, because now we're talking about the period from about AD 600, 700 to 900, AD 900. And in this period, towards the end of this period, we start to see uh, not just the Hoacom looking like West Mexico, we start to see lots of stuff that we identify as being Mesoamerican. Copper bells, uh, cocoa, uh, not chocolate technically, because it doesn't have sugar in it, but cocoa, uh, scarlet macaws, um, uh, iron pyrite mirrors, uh, pseudo cloisonne. I might add pseudo cloisonne as a West Mexican thing, as is copper bells, as is cocoa. Cocoa was grown in Nayarit, so it is also probably West Mexican. And a lot of people don't realize this, and you will not see it in a lot of literature, but there are, in fact, scarlet macaws in West Mexico, too. Uh, today, they exist in one small reserve uh, in, I think it's Jalisco, but I, I could check that if you want. Uh, but there, is, uh, prob there probably were wild populations of scarlet macaws uh, in West Mexico. Now, you have then, at the end of the Epiclassic, a reorganization of Mesoamerica. It becomes more politically divided, but more cosmologically unified, and, that cosmo and, and it also becomes linked by lots of exchange networks and lots of artisans moving around. You have elites, the, 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 where the cosmological unification comes from is the cult of Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. And this is a, a cult that justifies elite privilege and justifies elite position. It is Quetzalcoatl that raises the elite up from the, that, that, that transfers to the elite the kind of authority of heaven. Uh, and this is a very important part. And in this context, you also get uh, you know, and, and it's about this time that we start to see more of these kind of uh, things appearing in the Southwest towards the end of this period, about 8900. Now, also in this time period, West Mexico is undergoing some, going some really rapid changes, which make it even more distinctive from Mesoamerica. And these have to do with contacts to Ecuador. There are connections being established to Ecuador. Uh, I guess people are coming up on balsa rafts from Ecuador, and they're bringing with them metallurgy copper metallurgy, so copper bells, about 8,800, those start to be produced. You're also seeing, uh, in terms of uh, fabrics 
and in terms of sandals and things like this, uh, you're seeing uh, things that look like they came from Ecuador, not from the coast of Mexico. And in this context, uh, you know, th these things start then spreading out of West Mexico, north into the southwest, northwest, but also into core Mesoamerica. This is where the metallurgy of Mesoamerica uh, comes from, and this is how it then spreads to other regions uh, around there. Now, all of this gets transformed at about 8900 as we move into what's called the post-classic. Now, those of you who are, who are up on Southwest archaeology, 8900, you should be thinking, oh, we're moving into Sacaton Hoacom. We're seeing the beginnings of Chaco. Chaco starting a little after that. We're seeing the beginnings of all the fancy stuff at Mimbris. They built pretty sh architecture, but they did some really nice pots. Uh, and these pots uh, are some of the places we're seeing some of the early Mesoamerican things. Uh, and so with the oncoming of the, the uh, post-classic, we see the development of something that's been called the Mixteca Puebla horizon. And a recent argument that's been made by uh, uh, Mesoamerican archaeologist Mike Smith up at ASU being one of the major ones, has been that, the, that, that this Mixteca Puebla horizon, which is mainly something we see on polychrome pottery, uh, that this has really been, that we, in looking at this, we need to distinguish between the iconography of it and the style of it. And I think this, this distinction becomes really critical to understanding the connections to the Southwest. Now, what I mean by the iconography is I'm talking about the symbols. And basically, this horizon divides into an early and late symbol set. The early symbol set is the symbol set associated with the cult of Quetzalcoatl. And it, inclu it includes step frets, it includes feathered serpents, all kinds of things. Those of you who know the, the Southwest stuff well, uh, this may start to sound familiar. We see these things in the Southwest. Uh, the later uh, stuff is codex, uh, or codex uh, icons, which we do not ever see up here. They never get up here. But all of this is executed in Mesoamerica in something that's referred to as the post-classic style. Now style, we're not talking about the emblems, we're not talking about the icons, we're talking about how the drawings are executed. So that the drawings are executed in a very sharp way, very sharp corners, very geometric, uh, very brilliant colors. What it really comes down to, and I, I, you know, I don't know how else to put it, but it, it's kind of like pornography. You know it when you see it. If you're a Southwest archaeologist and somebody shows you this style, you look at it and you go, that's Mesoamerican. You might not be able to tell why, but every Southwestern archaeologist in the room, if I was to hold up uh, a photo or something of, of this image, you would go, they would immediately go, oh yeah, that's Mesoamerican. No question about it. Right? So what happens in West Mexico is we get something called the Azatlan. And the Azatlan is the West Mexican expression of this uh, uh, Mixteca Pueblo horizon. And it is the uh, West Mexican expression of all of this. And it comes up north, but it doesn't get to the Sonoran Desert. It gets as far north as Gusave in Sinaloa. And it does not go north of that. So for the first time, and we're talking about, a, we're, we're talking about around 80, 100, 900, 1,000 here. Again, if you're thinking about what's happening in the Southwest, Sacatone stuff is going really big, Holcom or you know, Snake Town's at its, uh, you know, at it is, 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 is a big site. It's at its, uh, what do I want to say, it's, its crest. Chaco's really getting going by, by 1,000. Uh, you know, the Mimbris is, is really going at about this period. But this, this Azatlan does not get north of Sinaloa, which is just, you know, Gusave is almost to Sonora. Uh, not quite, but it's almost to Sonora. So at that point, uh, but it is at this point we start to see more Mesoamerican items. We start to see stuff, we start to see copper bells, we start to see iron pyrite mirrors, we start to see pseudo cloisonne, again, mainly on the backs of iron pyrite mirrors. Uh, we have the wonderful work that, uh, uh, you know, that was done um, that shows that uh, there was uh, cocoa at uh, Chaco Canyon, that the, you know, these, um, these cylinder vessels, you know, in Mesoamerica, what does a cylinder vessel mean? It means you're drinking cocoa. Uh, and it's not, it's not chocolate, because you're not mixing it with sugar, you're mixing it with chili powder. Uh, so uh, you're drinking cocoa. Uh, and so, hey, surprise, surprise, the cylinder vessels at uh, Chaco Canyon are to drink cocoa with. All right, so all of these things are coming up. The earliest uh, image of Quetzalcoatl, of the feathered serpent we see, is on some ceramics from Snake Town from the Santa Cruz phase. 
uh, and then it starts showing up more commonly in the saccatone phase. But this, like I said, this, this, uh, this Azatlan tradition does not get up into Hohokam. And I would argue at this point, Hohokam is starting to be more uh, related, more uh, interrelated and all with what's going on in the southwest, northwest. It's no longer the northern tip of the peninsula. It is now, uh, and, and at this point I would argue, we can start to talk about a northwest, southwest, and a Mesoamerica. Because West Mexico, the Azatlan, is seen by many Mesoamerican scholars as being the Mesoamericanization of the Azatlan. Well, then something really crazy happens in the southwest. I mean, for, we've, we've been going along for a long time, and we've talked about the three little cultures. Ho'okam, Anasazi, Mogion. And you know, uh, there was a time, in fact, when I was originally trained, when Emil Howery was originally training me and other people here, uh, where we, you know, basically the story of Southwestern prehistory was the story of the three little cultures and how they grew, <laughs> all right? And the only problem with that story was when you got to about AD 1300 or so, actually a little earlier in some areas like Hohokam, uh, 1200, 1250, but somewhere in that 1200 to 1300 range, suddenly, what's Hohokam? What's Anasazi? What's Mogion? People who were Mogion are building pueblos and making black and white pottery, and they're building, uh, they're building uh, you know, above ground surface architecture in the Hohokam, and everybody's using all this polychrome pottery, and it doesn't follow the, any of the lines that, this, uh, that the three little cultures used to, 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 to think. So that you've got, you know, like Salado, uh, Salado polychromes, you know, extending, starting over in the uh, Phoenix Basin and extending all the way over into New Mexico, down Cliff Bays, uh, New Mexico, and, and further south there. Uh, you have White Mountain Redware, transcending what, was mo what previously had been Mogollon and Anasazi. You have the Jedido. Hopi, of course, are always purists saying right up there uh, with the Hopi. You know, that's good. Uh, and you have, uh, you have the Pueblo Glazewares, the Rio Grande, the Acoma, the, the Zuni Glazewares. And one of the things that characterize, so what do we do? How do we make sense of this? It doesn't make sense in terms of the old cultural boundaries, uh, cultural boundary approaches of the three cultures. The other thing about this stuff is it, these, these polychrome traditions, and, 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 and of course Casas Grandes, don't let me forget Casas Grandes, uh, is that they are loaded, they are loaded with uh, early post-classic symbol set. In other words, uh, the images, the icons of the early post-classic symbol set are all through these stuff. Not the style. None of these types not, are executed in a post-classic style. So they have the icons, but not the style. I think this is something that has not been widely recognized that is very, very important to understanding this. To me, this gives the lie to all these ideas of bunches of Mesoamericanists trooping up here to show the uh, kind of really ignorant Southwestern people how to do things. Because I would think that if uh, Mesoamerican rulers and artisans had come up, they would have been executing things in the post-classic style, not just using the icons of the symbol set. The other thing about these uh, ceramic traditions, these polychrome traditions, is we've had a variety of theories to account for them. And I think Southwestern archaeologists have, uh, have not done a good job of that. Either they are migrants. You know, this was uh, Howery's originally Salado idea that these were migrants from another place. Or uh, elite interaction networks. Uh, uh, Dave Wilcox and I were early advocates of this kind of position. Uh, Patty Crown's ideas that we're dealing with religious movements. I don't want to use the word cults, but we're dealing with religious movements. And I think what we're really seeing is a reorganization of the Southwest in such a way that they're really all of those things. That the Southwest is being reorganized in a way that really parallels what happened in post-classic Mexico, and I don't know how far I want to go with that other than to note it, which is that the air regions are becoming politically more divided cosmologically more uniform, and uh, very much integrated in trade. That you have populations of people moving around. Uh, we know we have uh, whole populations, clans, villages moving around. We, we see that. This is where we start to key into Pueblo uh, history and all, where they're talking about these migrations. We also know that we have artisans, the argument that uh, desert the people from the Center for Desert Archaeology have made about Cayenta artisans. Uh, moving around, and, and you know that's why it's a lot of polychrome is. But there's, there's been a flaw in that argument, and the flaw in that argument I see is that 
Somehow the idea is it's these Cayenta people that are coming up with the Quetzalcoatls and the step frets and the, the, uh, the, uh, the late post-classic symbol, the early post-classic symbol set. I would argue they're not, that they're no more coming up with them than crucifix ma makers are uh, Catholic the theologians. Uh, that, 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 that we don't, we should not look for the origins of these things and the artisans that are making the pottery. We should look in connections to uh, what's going on before and to, to further south. So that we have, uh, very similar to what's going on in Mesoamerica, some shared uh, religious beliefs. Uh, we, have, we, we see shared sets of elite artifacts, conch trumpets, turquoise on mosaic, uh, turquoise mosaic on shell, uh, a variety of other things that we see all across this region associated with elites. Uh, and uh, we also are seeing movements of people. So we're, it's a much more complicated picture than any one of those things would suggest, and it looks a whole lot like what happens in post-classic Mesoamerica. And again, I'm not suggesting, I, I am not absolutely, absolutely not suggesting that somehow this is a matter of Mesoamerican people coming up and doing that. I'm not suggesting that, but I'm suggesting we're looking at similar processes and that, that we need to look at them in this broad way. And then the thing that happens that I think is really interesting that hardly anybody's talking about is all of this goes down the tubes except for the Pueblos. Except for the Casina religion, all of this goes down the tubes. Casas Grandes goes down the tubes. Uh, whatever's going on with White Mountain Redware goes down the tubes. The, uh, what what uh, Patty Crown is called the Southwestern cult, I'd prefer to call it the Southwestern religion. Uh, cult, I think, is a problematic uh, term. Uh, goes down the tubes, the only thing that survives is the Pueblos. And as my last very provocative thing, I think the reason that happens is because I think that although Katsina religion looks very much, there are many aspects of it that look very Mesoamerican. There are many aspects of it, of ritual, there's many aspects of belief, et cetera, that look very Mesoamerica. In the end though, it is fundamentally different. And this is this is where, well, I'm not going to piss anybody off in this room, but I, there are people I piss off with this. In the end, it is fundamentally different. It is fundamentally different in the sense of the experience of it and the belief of it. In Mesoamerican religion, you have to sacrifice, both these religions are based on the idea that we or people in the world have to actively uh, act in ritual and all to maintain the cycle of the world. And that if we don't do that, the world will come to an end. This is common belief throughout Mesoamer these Mesoamerican religions. This is a common belief that we see in the Casino religion. However, in Mesoamerica, I think many of you may know how this was done in the, in the, in the post-classic, you do this through blood sacrifice. Uh, priests uh, had really raggedy ears because they would every morning cut their ear to offer blood sacrifice to the gods. And of course, we have the very famous events of dragging screaming captives to the top of pyramids and cutting out their hearts, which is kind of dramatic. Um, so I would suggest that even though uh, the uh, Pueblo religion has this same idea of sacrifice, that there is a fundamental difference to dancing at, in the mask of the casina, becoming the casina, and the priest laying corn polling blessings on you, as opposed to dragging you to the top of the pyramid and cutting your heart out. Uh, the other thing that, that, is, that, is, that is very much different in these religions is that in the casina religion, you very much have the idea that there are priests, and these priests have these really kind of contradictory powers but in the end, they are supposed to act like everyone else. They are not supposed to act pridefully. They are not supposed to raise themselves above. Whereas in Mesoamerica, these religions were very much to establish the ideology of class and to justify the class position of other peoples. And as my finally provocative statement, uh, what I have argued in an article soon to be published, which will review everything I've said here, uh, the, I would suggest that these other religions that we had in the Southwest, in Casas Grandes, in the Southwestern religion, uh, and these other areas that were not casino religion, were more like the Mesoamerican, and maybe this might be partly the explanation why they don't survive and why uh, the Pueblos do. And I suppose if I really wanted to get into it, I could get into ideas of Chaco and how the Pueblos learned at Chaco that you don't do these things, but that's a <laughs> whole other argument. So that, that, that's what I have, thank you. No idea how I did on time. Oh, too bad. Okay, 1,500 years of uh, yeah. prehistory <laughs> from the Valley of Mexico to uh, Durango, Colorado. Yeah. Whew. Okay. Um, I guess we'll. First off, can I just ask the crowd? Um, 
How many of you have actually been to the Valley of Mexico, seen some of the, the amazing archaeology down there? Well-traveled group. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and open the floor to questions. And if there are any immediate questions, um, I'll come right over. Hello. Um, I think what you're talking about is very interesting. Um, but through a lot of things that I've kind of studied on my own, I was wondering, um, does anyone see or do you see a connection between the serpent being used as kind of like a, a power thing or an icon within many other cultures, let alone Mesoamerica and, and Americans? Uh, you raise a good issue, which I'll even broaden. Uh, if we look at certain serpent symbolism in this, I'll just restrict it to North America, what I know, what I you know, feel confident speaking expert about. Uh, we see it all over the place. You have the serpent mound, Hopewell serpent mound. Uh, you have lots of people are using serpents for all kinds of things. There's also some other things. One of the uh, one of the concepts, uh, the the meanings that we see, the people commonly see between Mesoamerican Southwest are the warrior twins. And uh, we see the warrior twins. They're not called the warrior twins, but essentially they are the warrior twins with the um, uh, Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee in New York, where I now teach. And you know you have the belief that uh, the, the the mother fell through to the earth and gave birth to the to the twins and these twins. So the, there are many sets of beliefs like this that have a that have been discussed in terms of the uh, issues I'm talking about, but really have a distribution and all that is far far greater than Southwest Mesoamerica. Serpents is certainly one of them. Like I say, warrior twins is another. Uh, most uh, indigenous peoples in North America uh, either have a version of the beginnings of the world where people emerge from uh, a world below or fall through skydiver, uh, Haudenosaunee skydiver, where they fall through from the present. I can't get my head around that. Uh, I, you know, I mean, I thought about the Mesoamerican Southwest stuff, but as far as these broader parallels that extend over you know, the whole continent, let alone the fact that you know, people all over the world seem to be hung up with serpents. Uh, I really, that's far beyond where I've gone. Uh, but I think it's important when we're talking about Southwest Mesoamerica that we look at it. Now, when we're talking about feathered or horned serpents, that's something specific to the region we're talking about. The, the, the feathered or horned serpent, the furthest east it gets is the Pawnee, uh, have a belief in feathered or horned serpent. And you know, that's, that's the edge of it up there. Uh, but, so I'm not really answering your question, but I'm affirming that it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, in this area of Western Mexico that you, that you um, are linking with uh, the early Hohokam, what about ceremonial architecture? Is, are, are, is there a difference in ceremonial architecture? Do ball courts uh, travel down, or ball courts visible along these Western Mexican, Mexican sites? You have, you, have extensive, you have extensive ball courts in West Mexico, uh, in um, Jalisco, Nayarit, uh, Michoacan. Uh, you have lots of ball courts in the, God, I'm going to see if I can remember the time periods. Oh, OK, it's, uh, I think it's classic periods. So we're talking about, say, 8,600. I hope I got that right. Uh, you get, uh, you get in, in this region you get made these kind of uh, dioramas. And they are ceramic, and sometimes mm. they are yeah. uh, villages, and sometimes they're the ball game. And so you certainly, you certainly have the ball court. You also have, uh, you have you know, the kind of matching the Hocom. You have the kind of plaza-oriented uh, architecture with uh, mounds uh, that would seem to have religious purposes. Uh, this is certainly part of that. Uh, you know, see, we, we do see that all the way up along the line and all. So there are some suggestions. And in earlier times, uh, late formative or classic uh, figurine complexes. As you may be aware, pioneer period Hoakam, which would correspond to late formative in this region, we have extensive figurines, uh, very elaborate figurines, which uh, have the cocoa bean eyes, and little oval eyes with slits, uh, and stuff that uh, clearly uh, look much like what's happening in West Mexico. Very interesting. Another question? That's easy. Um, hi, I've spent a fair amount of time in China, and I mm -hmm. noticed that when I was going through there that uh, there was uh, a great deal of similarity both in iconography and some of the what seems to be the, 
the production methods um, between what I've seen there and what I've seen here in what you're describing. Do you have any comments about what might be going on there? Uh, this is a similar question to the one I've just asked, and I don't really, honestly, you probably know more about China than I do, quite honestly. Uh, production methods, I, I think we have to, we, when we're looking at production methods, we, I think we always have to be very careful uh, to realize that given a certain type of, given a certain, I hate to say level of technology, but given a, that's the one place I might use that term level, uh, given a certain level of technology, given a cert te certain technological problem, there are only a, a, a ver there's not an infinite number of solutions. So that uh, I would suggest that those parallels may relate to that. Uh, and for what it's worth, just to be totally off the wall here, Salutrine is not Clovis. But anyway, if, if some of you may have understood <laughs> that. Those of you that didn't, we'll leave it. But, uh, but as far as the iconography goes, I really don't know anywhere near enough about China to comment. Okay, question right here. Uh, other than Howry saying there are ball courts, mm -hmm. what evidence are there that the Hohokam ball courts are similar to Mexican or Mesoamerican ball courts? Well, that's, that's a complicated problem. Uh, we do have some balls, uh, rubber balls. Made, there is a plant, and I can't remember the name of it, that occurs in the desert around here that does excrete a rubber that you can make rubber balls from. During World War II, there was actually an attempt in southern Arizona to grow it to, because you know, most, at that time there was no uh, uh, synthetic rubber, so rubber was coming from the tropics. And like I said, I, maybe somebody else in the room. Hmm? Wayuli. Wayuli, yeah, that's it. And we, we, there, are, there have been uh, found a couple of Wayuli rubber balls. They were about this big. They were found in caves in the Phoenix Basin. Um, the other thing is that the um, ball game, uh, there are two versions of the ball game. Uh, the version that probably most of you might think of is what was referred to as the noble version of the ball game. And that was a ver version that was played with straight walls and with a ring. And the, you know, this is the one, and of course in all the ball games you can't touch the ball with your hand and you're trying to put the ball through the ring and if you put the ball through your ring you win and then people get their heads cut off and this is the noble game in uh, Mesoamerica. Uh, this is clearly not the game that was played among the Hohokam. Uh, there are some ball courts in the Casas Grandes area where it's, they might have played this game. This game could not have been played in Hohokam ball courts, even the big one at Snake Town. The sloping walls would not have allowed uh, the playing of this game, despite the National Geographic illustration which attempts to show <laughs> people playing this game. There was also what is referred to in Mesoamerica as the common ball game, which is still played in Sinaloa, the only place it's still played. And in this game, there are two versions of it. You either play it with a large ball, and you play the ball off your hip. Ball game is often called the hip ball game. And the idea is for two teams to pass the ball back and forth and to keep it in the air. And if you fail to keep it in the air, then you score. Uh, there's another version of this game that is played uh, with a smaller ball and is played off the wrist, and it tends to be played primarily by women. Uh, and again, it's the same principle, but you're playing a smaller ball off your wrist as opposed to a bigger ball uh, off your, uh, your, your, your uh, yeah. hip. Yeah, that's what that is. <laughs> One more glass of wine. Uh, that <laughs> Off your hip. Uh, these games are played basically in flat spaces, and these games could certainly have been played in Holocom ball courts. Um, other than that, uh, the only other thing I would say is that this is, uh, and, and a lot of, and the, vert, like when I was talking about those little dioramas, they show them playing the game in ball courts that, that do look like some Holocom ball courts. They're not playing, when I talk about these dioramas, they're not playing the royal game with the, with the ring, they're playing the common game off the hip. So. Okay, question here? Hi, Randy, would you elaborate on your comment at the beginning of your presentation about uh, the pole climbing clowns being a relatively late entrant? In, entrant into this the, has, been, this yeah. has been the traditional interpretation, um, and I'm not sure I can justify it, but there's a, there's a whole series of discussions of this that go back to the 1940s, uh, work by Beals, work by Parsons and others, and uh, they identify uh, the pole climbing as being something that was in the when when our, when uh, Oñate came up, you know, like most of these Spanish uh, expeditions, he had a several hundred Spaniards and a couple of thousands uh, indigenous people with him, and uh, you know, in the literature anyway, it's generally accepted that the pole climbing was brought at that time. Okay, the gentleman sitting next to me here uh, works at the Tree Ring Lab, uh -huh. and he's been studying a large uh, pole um, uh -huh. that's in a plaza at Chaco Canyon. 
And so that's just why I wondered that might have a, a pre-Hispanic. It could be. Yeah. It could be. Yeah. I don't know. It could be. Like I said, I'm what I'm what I'm giving you. I have not critically examined this. I'm just giving you what is okay. the what is what has been the okay. the, right. the traditional interpretation since the 40s. Okay. I think we have a question up front. We know that some of the other things like mariachi, uh, not mariachi, <laughs> Matachina, Matachina dance was of course brought forward because it's uh, originally Moorish. But anyway. Um, referring to the last part of your talk, mm -hmm. do you have any theories to account for why Mesoamericans in Hohokam with similar belief structures manifested themselves in such different ways that is sort of bloodthirsty and hierarchical in mm -hmm. Mesoamerica and what sounds like almost something more democratic? Well, when the democratic, I'm talking about Pueblo Katsina religion. You know, I'm, I'm not sure it's clear that the Hohokam, I'm not sure that what the Hohokam are doing on this, but I'm talking about the Katsina religion, which is uh, Katsina, religion, Katsina religion and Pueblo society is, is, is really interesting because anthropologists have been arguing for years. Can I, I'm looking to my Pueblo experts, can I say 100 years? Uh, a century or more, about whether we see these people as being hierarchical or uh, egalitarian. And it, this is a debate that goes way, way back. And something I've argued very strongly is what's really interesting is they're both. That they, they, they encompass both of these things in a, in, a, in a contradiction and in a conflict within Pueblo society. But Pueblo society very much has, you know, when you look at the Pueblo priests, on the one hand, uh, they can condemn somebody as a witch and have them executed, life and death power over other people. Uh, on the other hand, they're expected to be humble and to, to uh, share and participate with everybody else unless things get really bad and then minor clans and families are excluded from the Pueblo. Uh, so I don't know if I'm answering your question. I, I'm also interested in the question of bloodthirstiness. Uh, I don't think, I, I don't want to say that, Mes look, I do not want to say the Mesoamerican folks were bloodthirsty. Uh, it, it, you know, there's a lot of ad Nahuatl pot poetry it's this beautiful poetry until you realize that when they're talking about the drops of dew and the rain and stuff that they're really talking about blood. You know. Also, I think that uh, Aztec sacrifice, I think very clearly Aztec human sacrifice occurred. I think very clearly the Aztec did dry, drag people up to the top of pyramids and cut their house, hearts out, but the numbers were far, far less than what uh, was reported. Uh, the reason for this is quite simple. The Aztec were a tribute state Basically, if you're a tribute state, the way you get by is you go to other city states, you show up at the wall, and you say, pay up, or we're going to beat the crap out of you. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, you come to Teotihuacan, and we'll drag some of your people up to the top of that pyramid and cut their house hard. And by the way, when we designated this pyramid, you see all of these skulls here. We killed 10,000 people. That's what they told the Spanish. Uh, but I think they were exaggerating, uh, because we don't have the evidence of that. We do, we do have, in Mexico City, I mean, they have to, you know, when the Spanish overthrew Teotihuacan, they basically uh, leveled it, and they dug big pits, and they threw everything they found in pits, and some of those have been excavated, and they're not full of, you know, we found a few sacrificial victims, but in the hundreds, not the thousands, uh, and uh, we found, they found plaster skulls. So some of these skull racks were, in fact, uh, covered with plaster skulls. So I think what was really going on there is it was in the Aztec, the Nahuatls, the Mixtecas, best interest to overemphasize their bloodthirstiness because then people would pay up. But it was also in the best interest of the Spanish to highlight the bloodthirstiness of the uh, Nahuatl because then they could justify conquering them. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's actually some Mexican archaeologists that have argued that nobody was ever, ever had their cut, heart cut out. I don't buy it. We do have some direct evidence that we do have some sacrificial victims, uh, and their chests are, in fact, cut open. Uh, so I, I think very clearly they did, but I think very clearly they exaggerated it and the Spanish exaggerated it for their own reasons. All right. So my question is about um, a lot of the changes you mentioned at the end of the Classic period in, mm -hmm. in Mesoamerica, and especially after the early post-Classic, mm -hmm. are... I, I, I mean, maybe it's partly my opinion, but they seem somehow linked to the spread of the Nahuatl language group and the southerly extension of Uto Aztecan speakers, who eventually end up extending Mesoamerica into Nicaragua. Uh -huh. 
and they bring things like double pyramid complexes, range mm -hmm. structures, and various other things, especially Chalk in mool, the chalk mules and yeah, the, especially the whole at the end of the early the hard out ritual. Yeah. around 1100, 1250. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, what I, I guess what I'm saying is, if they're the people who, in some way, are driving the changes in Mesoamerica, how does that relate to the Southwest? Well, I first off, uh, although I think it is quite possible that what you're saying is correct, and I'm not. I'm not a, really a Mesoamerican specialist. I'm a, a, a Southwest Northwest archaeologist who's tried to read and learn about Mesoamerica with a definite focus on the North as opposed to the South and Nicaragua and stuff. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think that we can, I don't think we can summarize the changes that occur in the Epiclassic and into the Post-Classic simply by the movement of a single ethnic group. Uh, I think that probably, you know, I don't doubt that was going on and it may be, indeed what, be what you're talking about. Uh, some, uh, some Mesoamerican archaeologists uh, have suggest some archaeologists working in among Chalchuiches. We actually see some of this post-classic stuff earliest among the Chalchuiches, things like uh, Chakmuls, the earliest Chakmul is currently among Chalchuiches and stuff. And they've suggested that these were in fact the Chichimec that came down and brought this stuff to uh, central Mexico. So I guess I don't, I, I wouldn't want to question you know, the idea of the spread of the Nahuatl people. However, I see the changes that, I, that people talk about in terms of post-classic, in terms of elite interaction networks, political reorganization, shared cosmology. Uh, I think having a lot of people moving around works in that, but I don't think it's reducible to that. So, and that's not based so much on a substantive interpretation as on a more general understanding of how these changes might occur. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and ask one last question. The folks in the back are getting soaked slowly. So uh -oh. <laughs> for those of you uh, under the roof, have pity. And I'm out um, of wine. Okay. Um, so one last, one last question. Um, if you had a million dollar, you're given a, a million dollar grant, and there was no drug war in, in, in Mexico, <laughs> where, would you, where, would you, where would you look? What would you look for in terms of trying to f further flesh out the, this model uh, that you're proposing um, about the general conditions in the Americas? Well, I think this is <clears throat> it's a difficult question simply. I mean, if, if I had a million dollars and I could work wherever I wanted, I work in the Altar Valley, but that's because I love the Altar Valley and uh, I want to be there and there's good work to be there. This Trincheras culture stuff just barely south of the border. Uh, Altar Valley in Sonora is not the same as the Altar Valley in Arizona. They don't, in fact, connect. They're different valleys. Uh, but... Uh, uh, that's that's what I would do, but it would be because that's where I want to work. Yeah, it's, it's I love it there. That's where I'm whole, you know. Uh, but I think the the problem, one of the problems that we have, is that uh, West Mexico has been West Mexico has been a largely ignored area, and the southwest, south of the international border, has even been more ignored. And that's because everybody either wants to work up here, uh, you know, where we got lots of southwestern archaeologists working, or they want to work. Uh, down in Meso, you know, Teotihuacan, where the big stuff's going on, and so we, the interp one of the re one of the things that comes from my, what I'm saying here is a lot more work is now being done in West Mexico. A lot more work's been done in northern Mexico, and we're starting to get uh, views of those areas that are more internally constructed. You know, that are not be because because before what was happening is somebody was either coming down from the southwest, you know, like Howry sent Johnson down to uh, uh, no. Yeah, set down to look at look for the origins of the Holocaust. So you're taking a problem from Arizona and you're trying to interpret Sonora in terms of it. And the same thing is happening in West Mexico. People are taking problems from Mesoamerica and trying to interpret them in terms of West Mexico. And now we're starting to get more and more work done putting it together. So I pose, actually, if I had a million dollars, what I would really want to do is not so much field work, but do something that might actually synthesize all this. Because I've spent... I. You know, like I said, the, the positions I'm taking here are ones that have evolved over many years. And the current manifestations of them are very much a product of me spending almost 10 years now trying to learn what the hell was happening in West Mexico. And it has been extremely difficult. And it's been extremely difficult in part because it's mainly Mexican archaeologists working in the region, which is good. Mexican archaeologists are well-trained. Mexico has a very, very, uh, very good uh, archaeological community and all. And these are good people. Uh, but they might primarily communicate through uh, meetings. So you have to go down there and you have to go to all the conferences. 
and there's not been a lot of communication between different states and between different uh, research centers so that uh, it becomes very difficult to go down there and piece all this together. And if Ben Nelson was here and he's trying to write a synthesis of West Mexico, he'd probably be sitting back there going, Randy, you got that wrong and you got that wrong and you got, you know. Uh, so that uh, probably if I had a million dollars to invest, I would actually invest it in actually trying to pull together and really do what's necessary to do all that. Although I think Ben may be doing it for less money than that. <laughs> well, it would be money well spent. Yeah. Yeah. Randy, thank you so much. Thank you.